All right. This day, next year, the United States will decide on their next president. With the polls getting it so wrong in 2016, our next panel will explore what data, gut, and sentiment are telling us about what could be the most important election of the 21st century as the most divisive president in recent history will go up against a yet unknown opponent. Before we bring the panel on stage, let's have a quick recap of the last four years. President Trump, President Trump, Trump, President Trump, 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 President Trump. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. They are the fake, fake, disgusting news. The audit does not prohibit you from releasing your tax returns. This means the children and minors need to be detained separately. Very fine people on both sides. I'm not going to give you a question. You are fake news. One of my greatest achievements, exposing this corruption. Yes, I heard that. In their own way, each of our next speakers has been part of the story. Please put your hands together for Tim Alberta of Politico, renowned conservative political strategist Joe Pounder, the author of the upcoming book Impeach, the case against Donald Trump, Neil Kitchell, and the former head of business strategy at Cambridge Analytica and You've probably seen the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, Brittany Kaiser. Hello. How's everyone doing? Woo, fired up. All right, that Trump <laughs> video got everybody going, huh? <laughs> well, thank you for having us. We'll dive right in because we don't have much time and there's so much ground to cover. Neil, let's start with you. You are a big fan of this president, as we all know. Tell us, from a Democrat's perspective, what keeps you up at night right now as it pertains to next November, despite the president's unpopularity, despite the way he has polarized the electorate, domestically, what is it that you fear most that could happen to allow for his re-election next year? So let me first start by disagreeing with the premise. I actually don't think Trump will be on the ballot in 2020. I think he will be impeached. I think he will be removed from office. I think we're talking about a president who has tra trampled on the Constitution, sold our interests out to foreign governments, tried to do it secretly. Um, he is corrupt, he's illegitimate, and I think everyone in America, Republicans and Democrats alike, will come together when they see the facts. So I don't worry about Trump when it comes to 2020. I actually think impeachment may be bad for the Democrats in the sense that Pence is a better candidate, but I think nonetheless the Democratic Party and the Republican Party together are going to come together and remove this unconstitutional aberration from office. But what if impeachment doesn't remove him. I think right now we need to be absolutely terrified about Mark Zuckerberg's assistance in the Trump campaign's continual campaigns of voter suppression, of inciting violence, of using disinformation in order to achieve their goals. Uh, in my new book, Targeted, I talk all about, in detail, what happened in the 2016 campaign, both the Trump campaign and the super PACs, how they engaged in voter suppression tactics. They even had groups that were called deterrents in order to say, these are Democrats that are not swing voters, they'll never vote for Trump, but we can convince them to not go to the polls. They measured their success in decrease in intent to vote. And you know what? Mark Zuckerberg's recent policy of not policing political speech basically allows any politician to break laws we already have. Let, let's, uh, Go ahead. Joe, Joe let's, uh, you, were, you were laughing yeah. when Neil made the point about Trump being not just impeached in the House of Representatives, but removed from office yeah. in a trial by the U.S. Senate. And just to clarify for everyone, that would require 20 Republican senators right. joining a, a united Democratic caucus to remove the president from office, which seems about as likely as uh, ACDC coming out and playing on this stage right now. Right. But Neil believes that that will happen. Joe, as a conservative Republican, you say what? 
So no doubt that I disagree with Neil. Uh, nothing's going to happen to the president between now and 2020. He's going to be on the ballot. Uh, I think right now he stands a greater chance of being reelected uh, in 2020. Uh, I think there's a lot of factors that go into his race. I think one of them being nope, one of them being the fact that you know right now I think we'd step back. Right now, everything is seen as a referendum on Donald Trump. All the attention is focused on him while the Democrats are going through their nomination process. Eventually, this race becomes a choice, a choice between two candidates, Donald Trump and whoever the Democratic nominee is. I think once we have that choice, the president stands a really good chance of being reelected. What a so professional there on the fly, Joe Pounder. Uh, Neil, come back to you for a second on this. Assuming that Donald Trump is not impeached or that he is impeached but not removed from office. Are you concerned, and I want to get Brittany to weigh in on this also, that the Donald Trump who won in 2016 was running on a shoestring operation. There was really no campaign apparatus to speak of. He limped across the finish line against the very vulnerable Democratic nominee, Hillary Clinton. Four years later, Donald Trump has a very professional campaign apparatus with ultimately probably hundreds of million dollars in the bank behind him. Does that concern you considering how Democrats are going to spend the next six to eight months tearing each other apart for the right to oppose him in November? No, because I think no matter how professional the apparatus Trump runs is, and I think the proof of that we'll see, but it, it can't remove the record that this president has. And, you know, when you think about it in 2016, he won by just 107,000 votes in three states. That's what it took in those three swing states. And now there is an entire record of him destroying the economy, you know, separating children from families, trampling on the Constitution, thing after thing. I mean, but for me, the most important thing, and, and I think many people in the audience feel it, is this is a president who's fundamentally un-American who takes our values and shreds them. And I do think that Republicans and Democrats won't stand for it, whether, you call it, whether it's in the impeachment context or at the ballot box. Um, he can be as professional as he wants in his campaigns. He was not a professional president. Brittany, so. uh, I want you to weigh in on this question, however. If the Trump campaign whether it's their use of social media, whether it's their, their use of uh, perfectly legitimate voter mobilization efforts at home and, and getting out the vote in key areas of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, the states that are going to decide the outcome of the election. If you want to see the president defeated next November, how concerned are you about the professionalizing of his operation? Well, I believe in 2016, the operation got pretty professional, not until late spring of 2016, but a lot of my former colleagues moved to San Antonio and were working every single day to buy data, collect data from all around the world, and use that to create incredibly accurate models to figure out who is persuadable, to figure out who was neurotic and could be targeted successfully with fear-based messaging. And Unfortunately, we haven't learned anything from 2016 because that is still going on today, and Mark Zuckerberg is helping them do it. So I just want to take a step back from the rhetoric for a minute and focus on two factors. One, I think I disagree with Neil again, and we're going to debate later today, uh, with the fact that I think many people argue that the economy is actually one of Trump's biggest assets in 2020. We just had a great jobs report on Friday, nearly 7 million jobs added into the economy since Trump became president. I think a lot of policies, the point there too, it is one factor worth watching for the rest of 2020, how the economy performs. And as someone who was involved in 2016 and now in 2020 again, I think what's really amazing is how much more professional, even from 2016, the campaign has got. They're well resourced, they're pushing out a lot of content. I think it's really significant that someone like Brad Parscale is the head of the campaign because they're realizing that they have to push out so many messages to energize the base going forward into 2020. And I do think it's very significant too that the base is energized going into 2020. Republicans are united. And I think we saw just in the New York Times polls that came out yesterday that the battleground states are pretty tight. You're talking Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin again going into 2020, and there is a route for the president to unite the base, energize his voters, and get them to win those states. I think we got to remember 
that a lot of people said the same thing about Hillary Clinton in 2016, that it was pretty much a slam dunk for her to win. And I think the biggest uh, fallacy for the Democrats is to think the same thing going into 2020. Yeah, I definitely don't think it's a slam dunk for anyone. In the 2016 campaign, there was there were over a million messages that were sent out by Brad Parscale and his team. The Clinton campaign only had just over 50,000. So I really think the professionalism of the campaign is going to play all of the difference right now, and also whether or not we decide to regulate big tech and police political speech or not. Neil, Joe just referred to uh, one of the real phenomenons of, of the Trump era, which is how he has consolidated power within the Republican Party and how no matter what he seems to do or say, as he famously observed, he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and he wouldn't lose a single voter. And that has been true, largely speaking, among Republicans. This is a president whose approval rating within his own party is as strong as any president we've seen in a half century or more. That being said, he has alienated independents, he has alienated moderates, and there is the beginnings now of a, of a bit of an internecine struggle on the left for the future of the Democratic Party in the post-Obama era between your more progressive wing led by the Elizabeth Warrens and the Bernie Sanders and the AOCs and your more traditional center-left wing of the party embodied by a Joe Biden or maybe a Pete Buttigieg. How concerned are you that that civil war as it begins to brew on the left could ultimately alienate some of those same independents and moderates who are currently estranged from Donald Trump and his Republican Party? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, I guess I disagree with the idea that there's going to be a civil war on the left to kind to the right. I mean, Donald Trump is a 25, 28 percent president for those people in the base that are fired up, motivated by his racism and other calls like that, sexism, things like that. But I don't think that the Democrats have the same thing. And we just have an ABC poll just this morning, which I think bears this out. When you ask in a head-to-head Head, Biden versus Trump. Biden has 56% of the vote, Trump has 39. And if you take it to the far left of the party, someone like Warren, it's still 55 for Warren, 40% for Trump. So I think either way, you're never going to reach the kind of polarization that we've seen on the Republican side because you don't have candidates who are nearly as extreme. Warren is still far to the center compared to Trump, far to the right with the Republican Party. Um, and you just don't have this despicable record that Trump has managed to generate over the last four years. So uh, I think we still have a lot of time within the Democratic primary for these narratives to play out. And I do think what's very disconcerting for the Democrats is the fact that they've had to move so far to the left on issues like Medicare for all, energy, and so forth, where if you, di where you dive deeper into the polls, you see that not even Democrats are really united about uh, by some of these proposals like Medicare for all and the elimination of private health insurance. So there's a lot of time left to go within that primary. And while that's going on, we have to remember, it is really hard to knock off an incumbent president in the United States because of resources, because of the power of the presidency and so forth. So as these Democrats are going through it, the president remains in waiting. But I do think like the biggest danger for the Democrats is Elizabeth Warren is no centrist within the Democratic Party. Joe Biden may be more to the center, but at the end of the day has shown himself to be a little bit weakened as a candidate from where he was in 2016 and 2012. So there's a lot of narratives to play out. And I will say one of the things that we are seeing on our side is how unknown a Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren is. That's actually been rather surprising to us how definable they are going into the general election. Most people know Joe Biden as Obama's vice president, but they don't know much more, quite honestly. I think Elizabeth Warren, despite the motto of, you know, she has a plan for everything, most people actually don't know what she stands for. So a lot of these narratives that you're hearing here are very much contained within the DC echo chamber. There's still a lot of general election voters who haven't made up their minds about who Elizabeth Warren is and Joe Biden are, even if they have made up their mind about Donald Trump. And that's why the president, I think, is a very good position going into the election. I want to begin by just saying I agree with Joe about something important, which is that it is hard to defeat an incumbent president, and particularly hard to defeat an incumbent president like this, who cheats on the election and tries to get help exactly. from foreign governments using huh. his commander-in-chief powers yep. and hiding what he did. 
So, yeah, I mean, I do think it's hard, but he got caught red-handed, and he'll get caught again and again because now the gig is up. Well, Bri Bri I, Brittany, uh, let's, I want to bring you in. You are the uh, resident numbers guru here. Uh, Neil referenced earlier the extremely narrow margin for error that this president is working with based right. on the 2016 results, and it was actually even smaller. It was 77,744 votes in those three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. That's probably about the number of people you could fit in this stadium, so right. a very small margin for error. Yes. If you are the Trump campaign, if you are in charge of getting this president reelected, where are you most focused? What are the demographic groups that you are zeroing in on right now and micro-targeting and know that you need them to turn out in large scale in order to win re-election. So I actually really do think that a lot of people are already decided. Democrats are definitely voting Democrat. A lot of swing voters are voting Democrat because they are anti-Trump and they've already pre-voted on that referendum, so to say. The main problem is that there are a lot of people that are not decided whether they're going to go vote or not. Not for whom, whether they're actually going to make it to the polls. And you know what I saw? I saw in 2016 that it's very easy to take disinformation or an incitement of racial hatred, for instance, and target that at African Americans in vulnerable areas, at conservative women who didn't believe that Hillary Clinton should have stayed with a husband who cheated on her. There are all of these different ways that weaponizing sexism and racism was used for voter suppression. So if the Trump campaign can manage to keep enough of us at home, Yes, he's going to win again. But if all of us actually show up to the polls, no, he doesn't have a chance at all. So Joe, do you, th do you think there's, uh, piggybacking off of that, do you think that we all know that Donald Trump won the presidency in the Electoral College despite losing the popular vote by some three million votes. Do you think that there is an opportunity for the president to overperform in 2020 relative to 2016? Do you think it's possible for him to win more raw total votes nationwide in 20 than he did in 16? I actually do believe it's possible. And I, for, for one big reason, I totally agree. I, I think we are seeing almost the end of the swing voter, the undecided voter in American politics. Everyone has so much more information at their disposal that they are making up their minds. It really is a battle now of getting them out to vote and what messages do propel them. I have a difference of opinion about what messages are being used uh, and so forth, but I think it's really more about identifying what niche issues within what states. I think it's important to remember for the audience, yes, there are national polls that show 54% for Joe Biden and so forth, but this contest is gonna be won in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Florida, and there are a lot of issues particular to each of those states. For example, I think one of the biggest significant uh, problems for the Democratic Party is the last debate where they all talked about wanting to end the practice of fracking, wanting to end the practice of drilling in the United States fossil fuels, that is a big driver of employment in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, and so forth. So I think those are going to be niche issues that are going to be used effectively to turn out voters. And I do think it is a battle of turning out the least enthusiastic voters to actually go to the polls and become part of the democratic process. So in that regards, I think it's actually a good practice uh, by both campaigns. And as much talk about Russia and so forth, like we do have to remember that probably, you know, if Hillary Clinton had visited Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania a little bit more, she might have been able to turn the tide. Neil, well, I, I, don't, I, I just wanted to cut in here and just because you mentioned Russia, which is that I think we all really get caught up on foreign ele election intervention, but the biggest threat to our democracy is not foreign, it's domestic. There was over $600 million that was spent in the Trump campaign, $1.3 billion by the Clinton campaign. Russia only spent a couple hundred thousand dollars. And yes, they reached 127 million Americans, but not with the millions of messages that the Trump campaign did. And we need to be very vigilant of that. Neil, I want to ask you, for, for all of the mythologizing of the white working class vote that came out in mass for Donald Trump in some of these industrial Midwestern states that we've been mentioning, the story that probably gets less attention than it should is how badly Hillary Clinton underperformed among the Obama coalition. And, and when we talk about the Obama coalition, we're talking about young voters, we're talking about women with college degrees, we're talking about minorities, uh, specifically African Americans and Hispanics. And in those three states that we were talking about, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, you saw Hillary Clinton underperforming Barack Obama by six or 700,000 votes. So really, whatever Donald Trump was doing to mobilize his coalition, 
coalition was probably less important than what Hillary Clinton was not doing to mobilize the Democratic coalition. What does the Democratic nominee need to do, whether it's Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, whoever it is, what is the single most important thing that the Democratic nominee needs to do to make sure that those voters who are predisposed to voting Democratic do, in fact, get out to the polls, as Brittany said? Right. I think it's just to remind people of Trump's record. So 2016 seems to me fundamentally different because you didn't really know what Hillary Clinton was about. You didn't really know what Trump was about. They were both people who hadn't served as president before. But this election's different. You've got a record. And I think the Democratic candidate, all they have to do is really explain the fact and I agree, Hillary Clinton was not the greatest candidate, didn't go to Wisconsin and things like that. I don't think that, by the way, excuses, you know, trying to collude with the Russians and stuff like that. It just means she wasn't a great candidate. But I think as we move into 2020, the focus has got to be on Trump, on Trump, on Trump. And frankly, I think this piece of paper can beat Trump once you look at the record. I think that right now... Anybody that is going to become the Democratic nominee needs to be prepared for their own version of the defeat crooked Hillary campaign because guess what? It's definitely coming. Let's, let's close on this. We're just about out of time, but I want to make sure since we're all in the prediction business here in politics and we are exactly one year out from the election, I want you to go on the record right now and this crowd will remember your prediction and they will mock you for the rest of your lives if you're wrong. We'll come down the line. Joe, how many electoral votes does Donald Trump win in 2020? Right, uh, 290. 290, so he is re-elected president. Re-elected president. Neil, how many electoral votes? If he's on the ballot, 250. 250, so he loses. Finally, Brittany, how many electoral votes does Donald Trump win? I would say 250 or less. 250 or fewer. So we've got Donald Trump being re-elected in Joe's scenario, Donald Trump either not being on the ballot or losing in the other two scenarios. Thank you all for having us, and we will look forward to coming back next year and revisiting these predictions.